helping you with Acorn and Riscos computing. Okay. Um, yeah. Got some little notes as to how to hide all the annoying bits and pieces. Right. Okay. So um, we're going to start off with uh, a very quick look at a few of the improvements that are coming uh, with RiscOSM. Uh, and by the way, we, we've, we've not got very many screens to look at here. So uh, if there's any questions that you want me to field, please uh, shout up um, because I won't be looking at the chat or indeed any faces. Um, so um, one of the things, this is a before and after look um, at uh, some of the changes. Uh, you see the, the A1M going past on the east side of Durham here. Uh, on the on the left hand side, which is the before, um, you'll you'll see that there's absolutely no doubt it's the A1M. It's labelled about six times, uh, whereas on the right hand side it's just on once. Um, the reason for the change is that we were doing a very kind of naive way of labelling roads. Basically, um, if you hover over the A1M with your information button on. You'll see it highlights um, a chunk of road and it tells you that it's way number 4143440 in OpenStreetMap. Um, and by and large, you get a change of way number whenever any of the attributes change, like the speed limit or the number of lanes or that kind of thing. So as we're approaching a junction, we then get another little bit. Um, I don't know what changed there between the two. But um, what was happening before was uh, every single little chunk, it tried to uh, label them. And you'll see the several A1Ms around about the junction because it's labeling slip roads possibly, or, or I'm not quite sure why. There's quite so many there. There's probably both sides of the road for one thing because you'll, be, you'll have the dual carriageway in effect. And so there are actually two ways very close together. So um, in the uh, new version, which isn't released yet, we're still ironing out some bugs. So apologies if it explodes at any point during the demo. Um, uh, the uh, road naming process goes through and uh, links together any roads which have the same name and the same number, even if other attributes are different, and it attempts to label them uh, a single time rather than all over the place. So if we uh, jump in a little bit closer, uh, not in uh, Durham, but in another part of the country, just a little example we've prepared. Um, you'll see that not only does this have the effect of not, um, not uh, labelling roads multiple times, uh, but we also have some improvements which have made some roads appear on the map labelled for the first time. Uh, over here, you see we've got um, a road called uh, Bramcote Road, which is not labelled. And on this side, it is labelled. Cromwell Road is labelled in the new version. And uh, here is an example, Humber Road South. It changes from a residential street to a, um, to a tertiary road partway along. That meant in the past that it would have had to have been labelled twice and the road name was far too long to fit on at this scale. And so, as you see on the left hand side, it's just not labelled. And you've got Beacon Road there, which isn't labelled. So you'll be getting a lot more names appearing on the map at uh, smaller scales, which I think helps you to find your way about. Um, and we're also trying to make sure that where possible, the names then the names are going to try and go on straighter chunks of road and try and avoid, if it's split across uh, several junctions, it's going to try and avoid uh, the bits near the junctions, which means you do tend to get a bit more labelled where otherwise roads would have crossed over each other and the one label would have stopped another label going on. So there's quite a few uh, more there's maybe a few more refinements to work on, but um, it's uh, it's looking a lot better and we're quite pleased with this. Uh, I'll just move a bit further west um, where there may or may not be some more examples that are useful to see. Um, yeah, Clumber Avenue, for example, appears 
on the new one and wasn't labeled on the old one because it's got too many fiddly little bits that so uh, are separate ways in the data source um yeah obviously there are of course the odd there's the odd road which ends up not being labeled that was labeled before just because of other interactions um and other things getting prioritized so um there'll be a bit of change to a lot of maps um one thing which doesn't affect roads so much but is also but does affect uh, rivers particularly um we because because this labeling applies to any kind of way that has a, a name along it like a river or a, or a path of some kind of its named path um one thing that we've done is uh make sure that if the uh, text ends up being largely upside down because the the, the, the river wiggles about a lot. Um, we detect that the text has ended up largely upside down and label the river in the opposite direction to make it the right way up again. Um, so um, yeah, that's a few things we've been doing there. Um, right, I'm just going to expand this window again. We'll we'll quit the old version of RiscoSM to make sure I don't get confused. And let's get uh, the window a bit bigger again. I hope this is at a reasonable scale that you can see fairly clearly, because I don't want to make it much smaller. <laughs> um, right, now from my demos folder, um, I don't know, can you see a picture of me as well as the screen when you're watching, or are we not visible? Yes, you are visible. Right. Well, we were delighted uh, just before Christmas to receive a, a copy of a book um, which was sent to us by Koos Fokkens in uh, the Netherlands. And it's actually his doctoral thesis uh, on the accumulation of man-made radio noise, um, looking for sources of radio noise in residential areas. So he's been doing this um, research uh, with... Um, uh, the University of Twente, and um, the whole book is produced, I think, using TechWriter. It is uh, full of graphs which um, are made using RISCOS software. He has pictures from time to time of his equipment, uh, including uh, various bits of exciting electronics that he's taken around in his car, um, a portable uh, data logger, which you may probably won't be able to see, but it's running the SCOS. And um, yeah, and then from time to time, he has, can't find any now, there's about three or four uh, maps produced with Risk SM. Here's one. Uh, and you, you will not really be able to see this very well, which is why I'm just about to do one of them on um, here. So a few years ago now, he contacted us and said, you know, I'm I'm measuring I'm measuring values as I drive my car around um, the area, and I want to plot uh, points on the map, including colours. Um, and uh, can can you suggest how to do this? So we thought this was quite interesting, and um, we added some features to Risk OSM to make it easy. So here's one of his CSV files. Um, you've got the number of the reading, latitude and longitude, and from the um, header of the CSV file, RISC-OSM has worked out that you probably want to load those into the latitude and longitude field in RISC-OSM. Uh, we've got a value, which is suggesting we might put in the pin name. Um, and then what he's done is he's generated uh, an RGB uh, color number and uh, that those can be loaded in. I think we've got uh, the ability to have it as hex as well in RRGGBB form to be a little bit more cross-platform. Um, and there is also the option of setting, if you want to, the diameter of the pin that gets plotted. Um, I think all of his examples are four in this particular case. But we added a few features like this. And if we just uh, load this in, uh, we'll see um what sort of map it produces Let's try and uh... 
put the window back to full screen size. Ah, nearly there. Um, There's a lot of detail on maps of the Netherlands because they're very conscientious methods, aren't they? Yeah, the, all the agricultural uh, land uses and lots of detail about the houses. Um, I'm surprised it's taking this long to load, actually. I'm sure it was a bit quicker earlier. Oh, oh dear me. Computer's about to go pop. hope not. This is very slow for such a fast machine. I don't think this is a reflection of uh, being relayed by a VNC. This is probably going on. No, okay. Well, apologies for this. Uh, shortly, we will uh, get some results. There we are. So as you can see, he's, he's, he's driven his car around a particular route and uh, with um, an exciting piece of apparatus on the uh, roof rack with an aerial um, and, um, and with a, a portable wrist machine on the passenger seat, which I have to say I was a little bit alarmed and then I remembered it was uh, left-hand drive. Um, he has taken readings of uh, radio interference strength of some kind, um, which goes on this map. So yeah, it's it's delightful uh, piece of well, an amazing piece of work because it's all written in English as well, which is absolutely I I can't believe how just so uh, detailed and technical this thing is. And uh, you get a, a screenshot of some of the software he developed for analysing things. Um, and um, yeah, so that was quite a nice surprise. Um, we're, we're always interested to hear how people have been using uh, our software, and uh, uh, that was really quite a, a, an outstanding run. So anyway, um, moving on, um, I'm just going to quit this in case something has gone wrong, um, and we'll, uh, we'll run it again. <coughs> now, I don't know how many of you will have been uh, at the uh, Raugol uh, talk that we did back in July. So I'm going to try not to repeat too much from then. Uh, but there is a little bit of um, stuff that uh, is just worth setting the scene. So if we uh, we head into uh, Wakefield, um, get into the city centre, not that very many of you are necessarily close to Wakefield at the moment, um, now that we're all online. Um, <clears throat> you'll see uh, that the Recce application, which uh, accompanies, can accompany RISC-SM, uh, has had uh, food hygiene ratings added. Uh, you can optionally put in a search term. Um, and it will then go and have a look uh, for, oh, I tell you what, I've gone and um, told it to limit it to 15 results as well. That doesn't help. Um, let's, let's go mad and just get loads of them right. So um, the food hygiene people have, um, still surprised how few there are actually. There should be all of those pubs. Yeah. Perhaps they don't do food. Never mind. Um, so uh, the food hygiene people have um, an API which allows your computer to talk to them and ask for details. And you'll see there's uh, a pleasing number of fives uh, in Wakefield, which is the best. Um, and I think the colours, I seem to remember, are for different sorts of establishment. So if you look at the pins and tracks window, You'll find uh, the red ones are restaurant, cafe, canteen. Uh, the blue ones are caring premises. Uh, green appears to be various sorts of retailer. 
Um, Orange is a pub, bar or nightclub. Um, so it's just an example of yet another piece of information you can get. And of course, um, maybe if the area isn't mapped so well, there might still be food hygiene ratings, which will give you a clue as to where to go to get something to eat. And the other things that we added on to Recce, um, we've had for a long time uh, the ability to read um, the weather forecast. Um, and here is the weather forecast for, um, let's look at tomorrow, shall we? Looks a bit black cloud uh, for most of the morning. Um, but opening a map in order to then get a weather forecast, of course, is not the most convenient way to do it. Um, so there is now on the um, icon bar from for Recce a weather option, and you can then put in uh, where you really are. Like let's let's see what's in store for Vince's part of the country, and we'll see that uh, Bristol looks. A bit nicer actually, doesn't it, for tomorrow? Um, so that way you can get up the weather forecast without having to pull a map up first. Um, and I, I skipped over that. And, and similarly, you can do that with uh, Street View if you want to pull up a um, pull up a view outside uh, your house or at a particular address. Um, so I don't know if we. If we wanted to look for, um, uh, where shall we go? Um, how about uh, St Pancras Station? Oops. London. Um, it should then go and, oh, we're actually inside. There we are. Um, Probably won't navigate around so well once we're inside. There was a little cross, yes, we can move along a bit. There we are. Oh, what, what, how late is the train? <laughs> um, jolly good. That's the, the Eurostar departures, isn't it? Paris. And uh, the food looks quite nice. Anyway, there we are. Um, now, uh, the point is with this that um, Recce um, is using a new facility that we introduced in the summer, uh, which comes with Nominatim. So Nominatim is this little helper application, uh, which um, comes with Risk SM, which uses the online um, Nominatim database from OpenStreetMap, which is all of the names of all the places in OpenStreetMap. Um, and you can search Nominatim through an API and call stuff up. Now, uh, Nominatim has now gained the ability to have to be used as a plugin in other applications. So if I went and actually had a look at, um, if we go into demos and open Recce's templates file for the uh, Street View, I wonder which one it is actually. Init View, Init View, that's the one. So this is the this is the window for opening Google Street View, you'll see this in the templates file for Recce. There's actually only a box here which has a display button. Because in fact, all of this area uh, is provided by Nominatim. So there's a little protocol uh, which we've documented in Nominatim's help files, um, where when you've got an application and you're opening your window, you can say, OK, in this area of my window, I want you to put up a um, a place selector feature, please. And um, nominal symbol then overlay a child window on your window, um, and it all behaves pretty nicely. Um, so not only can you type in and search online, but you've also got access to the whole um, Gazetteer that comes with Risk OSM. So this is coming straight off your disk. Um, you've got a common, uh, you've got a recent places uh, thing here, which remembers the last 10 places you looked up. 
And of course, that's across all applications. So you'll get the same ones for the weather as you will for the other things. And that may or not, may not be a good thing. Um, and what's more, you can do fun things like um, supposing you've got a um, picture uh, which has um, geographical data embedded in the JPEG. If we if we drop that on there, uh, possibly. Does it Maybe these ones don't have. Uh... Okay. Ah, there's one. Yeah, you see, it, it's uh, it's got the. I think some of them don't have actual geographical data. That was why do I keep them in there? Then no good for any demos. Uh, and then that will then bring up. Um, which one was it? The bottom left one. Bottom left. So we can see this was the slightly bendy picture of uh, Durham Cathedral that <laughs> someone managed to take by moving the camera. Um, and uh, this is uh, the reality on a on a rather duller day um, in approximately the same place, um, which is quite impressive. Um, so that can be built into your own applications, and um, what you then get is when the, when the user um, has um, selected a place, you then get sent a little message which contains the coordinates and uh, possibly a description of the place, that kind of thing, if there is one from the data source. Um, and we've used that, of course, in our relatively new application A to B, uh, where you have more than one of these selectors in the same window. So you've got this thing for selecting the, 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 the data set you're going to use, uh, and then you've got a place selector and from and two. Um, and as you can see, there are different options you can have with these place selectors. Uh, you can have a you can have a flag if you want to allow people to drop something onto the map to say I'm wanting to start my journey there. Then you can do that. And when the flag gets dropped on Risk SM, uh, a little message gets sent back to Nominatim to say uh, it's been dropped on City Fields, Wakefield, West Yorkshire, and then that description appears in here. Uh, and then a bit later on, those details will get passed to A to B, which then does its work and probably uses these names again itself. If you add a via point, then you get even more of them. Um, do you think I need to do an actual yeah, yeah, another, place. another place? Oh, okay. Well, we'll go from here to here. Better demo it. So uh, find route. And no. oh well, you shouldn't have done that because it's now found a bug. Well, I don't know what version they should be. Ah, the good thing is, as this is being recorded, we can watch the video again and try and reproduce <laughs> the problem. It may not be the most recent version of software. This was not going to be part of the demo, right? Okay. So moving on, um, the main thing we wanted to talk about, as we were explaining in the uh, publicity, which I hope you saw is some of the more advanced uses you can make of Risk OSM. We've seen that a bit of that with the CSV file, but now we're going to be talking about other ways that you can communicate um, with Risk OSM. So police data is something that I worked on with my uh, one of my sons, and um, it uses a police API. I'm just going to go and clear out these pins and tracks. And I remember asking for an enhancement for Risk OSM especially for demos, where there would be a quick way for clearing out all the rubbish, uh, especially when the mouse is going funny. I thought this mouse wasn't going to be misbehaving. Chat, kind of hang on. There we are, right. Get rid of them. Delete. We get rid of all the food and the weather because we've got something much more scary to come. Um, so police data uh, goes and gets information about crimes. Um, so if you click on crimes within map area and it'll show you the last month's crimes, um, which I have to say really does get quite alarming. Um, and um, 
Yeah, I didn't test it on Wakefield beforehand, but anyway, there's 886 in that area. Um, again, you can see more details, should you wish to, um, on the pins and tracks window. So you'll see the, the orangey ones are antisocial behaviour. Um, then a lot further down, we have uh, other theft in green, vehicle crime, violent crime. There's an awful lot of blue, actually, isn't there? Um, and uh, oh, and criminal damage and arson and burglary. So there you have it. Also, and bicycle theft. Only four bicycle thefts in November 2023. Um, possibly safer to be a bicycle than this is to be a person from all the violence. Um, so I better clear all that out again, because um, that really is clogging up the whole place. And the point of this is, is not to scare you witless, because uh, I bet this was all happening and you didn't know anyway, and you were perfectly happy. Um, the point is that we've written this in BASIC and we've released it on our website and we put lots of nice comments in. And you can open it in Zap or in StrongEd if you prefer, depending on how you like your colors. Um, and you can see how it all works. So we've documented, and they're on our website in a, in a nice um, documentation area. Um, if you go to our website, Developer Resources, there is information about the protocol uh, to allow you to talk direct to RISC-SM and send data through. It tells you a bit about what you might do. And that's where you can get police data if you want to. Um, so this gives you an example of how you might use an API from BASIC to get some stuff off the web. It has a not totally complete, but good enough for this purpose, uh, JSON parser. JSON is a data format, very popular data format. So there's a JSON parser in BASIC in there. And it then talks to RISC-OSM and passes the, the data through. So this is just to, because I think the easiest way to learn about programming often is to sign of follow someone else's efforts and muck around with it and amend it. And that's a good way to get started. So that is one that we've released. And we did demo back in July at Raugol another little one, which is called Mapwalker. And for that, I need to go somewhere else. So here we are. So Mapwalker is written in Python. Uh, now, I don't know whether Chris Johns is here. He said he might hope to come along. But uh, this is all based on his amazing efforts to get, not only to get an up-to-date Python ported to RISCOS, but also to write a toolbox library for Python, uh, for, for, for RISCOS, which is really impressive. Um, so Mapwalker is very simple. You just click on the window and it pops up a place selector, just like, uh, which is coming from, from Nominism. And we decide where we want to B, um, I'm going to go to a random place um, and I popped in a postcode. That was another thing you see, you can type into the place selector just a postcode. And we get a uh, window here with the pin on. And then these little arrows allow you to move the pin around. Yeah, obviously, it's a very crude way of getting about. But it's just to demonstrate. Um, it's a little demonstration of how to use the place selector, how to then send the information through to RISC-SM to open a map, how to then carry on talking to RISC-SM to move the point about. And all of that's done in Python. So it's also a useful demo of how to write a Python, a very simple uh, toolbox uh, application in Python. Um, I'm not going to, well, Let's just go inside the code, if I can find it again. Uh, we've not released this one yet, uh, and th this applies to the other Python things I'm about to show you, but that's partly because the, the 
the risk the library is changing quite has been changing quite a bit over the last few months and it's hard to know exactly when to when to release it when it's all stable so we hope to do that very soon uh, but the the application um, is actually very short there's not a lot to it um, and uh, it's very neat how all of that's done one of the great things about it um, one of the great things about Python is the way you can uh, build little uh, library files which can do nice little purposes so the geodata messages which are used to talk to risk uh they're quite complex there's a lot of them and they have a lot of parameters and you've got to do things like converting the um the data all into the right formats so this file here um this geodata python file is something that we can plug into any application that we want to uh, for talking to risk osm via these geodata messages and uh, if i just move down we'll find let's find a really clever example um so yeah here's one um if you're a an application like police data or recce that has some data sets available for use then when risk osm opens its find web photos and geodata uh, dialogue it needs to put up a little description for the user of all of the data sets available it does this by sending out a message saying what data sets do you have and all of the applications reply and they give a title and they may also give some extra data. So if you hover over Met Office weather there, you'll see at the bottom of the window, just above the fetch button, it says weather forecasts are on the Met Office. And collisions, stats 19, it says road collisions based on stats 19 data from 1999 to 2021, um, and, and so on. So um, the message has to contain a title and also a description and because i didn't want to limit the length of the title uh, particularly i didn't say when i defined this protocol i didn't say well you've got 20 characters for the title and the rest is going to be description the title can be as long as you want and then the description follows immediately afterwards with a null byte in between now that's a bit fiddly to actually enter into your um message block um it's okay if you're using C uh, or basic, but it can be very fiddly with Python. But the great thing is that we can define uh, this way of handling the message. And when we're creating one of these messages, we just basically say that we're creating a, a data set details message. Um, and then we set the values um, just by saying uh, the message message dot title equals whatever and message, message dot uh, description equals whatever um and what happens behind the scenes this thing here is is uh defining the description setter so when we say message dot description equals something it takes the value uh it reads the title that you've already got and then it calls this internal routine to set both the title and the description and that takes both of these things and shoves them into the buffer in the right place so that one's following immediately following the other and it also sets the message size in automatically so that the message block the size field at the start of the message block is set to exactly the right number for transmission of the message efficiently to the other end um, and this can be done for any properties that you need to define in a message and so we've done quite a bit of work putting all of this together there's a few few things there we've got little notes about how we could improve it a bit so I've really enjoyed doing uh, this kind of quite bit of plumbing behind the scenes to make it easier to use the, the messages. Right, so here we are getting onto the new stuff and we're only uh, uh, slightly over half an hour in. <laughs> um, and there's a moderate amount of new stuff. So uh, GPX player. GPX player is another little Python application we've just done. Um, now, um, 
one of the things that um, is quite fun with Risk SM is you can hook it up to Chris Hall's uh, SatNav application. I'll wave at Chris because I know he was there, but I can't see see any of you. So there we go. Um, and if uh, you know Chris has brought uh, his uh, GPS devices along to lots of shows, uh, but of course because none of the user groups have yet arranged to have a show on a moving barge or on a train um, or even an aeroplane, you know, I mean, why don't we hire a coach or something? It's not really been possible to demonstrate uh, sat-nav moving along uh, the river or the road or whatever uh, and the map updating, um, which is a shame. Now, you can record the um, the, track, uh, the, the positions, and Chris has done a bit of this, um, and, a, and a few different formats. Um, but from BASIC, which SatNav is, it's, it's a bit fiddly to take an arbitrary XML file and uh, kind of replay it. So I'm just going to go and find an example XML file. Um, Mm hmm it's probably one of these so <coughs> so if we just open this you'll see that uh, gpx files which you get from recording them on your phone or other kind of devices uh, they've got a lot of stuff in here and they don't have to have line breaks in exactly the same places, and there could be all sorts of spaces in there or not in there. And you've got to cope with these time strings, which are quite involved. And I think writing some basic to do that, uh, well, it just seems an awful lot of effort because it's just so complicated. And you've got to deal with a lot of cases. You know, you could write some basic, but to get it to work with any XML file any GPX file like this uh, reliably would take quite a lot of special cases and you know, very careful work. Um, now, uh, Python has an XML parser available with it, which is very good and very efficient. Um, and so uh, what we've done here with GPX tracker, uh, sorry, GPX player um, is uh, write a little thing which will uh, let's just try that so it's going to draw the map first which will replay i, I tell you what we better oh. so it's still got a map it has up there i think it's just trying to show both of them but we'll oh dear 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 right she quit there quit the whole computer Oh no! Yeah, sorry. There is a definitely a definitely bad bug in this uh, version of uh, Risk SM. So we will uh, just uh, relaunch in a moment. Um, perhaps now is a good moment for people to ask questions or uh, make observations on anything so far. While we've got a minute, while the computer is restarting. This is a real peril because this is really hot off the um, compiler, this uh, program. <laughs> um, right. We're going to reconnect to the VNC server. Here we go. Uh, how many people uh, do you know of that are using the messages function in Risco SM? I th the only one I'm really aware of is you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and this is partly why we're trying to make a few more example programs to inspire folk. Um, I think there was, uh, yeah, do you want to find stuff? Um, oh, yes, get the resolution right. Um, it was that one. It was 1280 by 1280 by 720 I was doing. Uh, yeah, um, I think, actually, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that because... There's certainly, we've had some correspondence with someone who has uh, little uh, radio-based GPS devices which get put on um, sailing dinghies for races uh, and keep track. Um, so, uh, yeah, you've got RiskSM running, right. 
and we need uh, we need GPX player, and we need a GPX file, which is somewhere in here. Uh, GPS stuff, Durham. So let's try again. So what I'm doing when I drop this on here, GPX player is going to read the file, and it will send the first point in the file through to Risk OSM as a place that where it wants to have the map drawn. And then it is going to replay the next locations as as it's going to play through the file. At the moment, it's doing it 10 times speed just to make it slightly more exciting. And while I'm doing that one, I can actually get another one going, uh, except, of course, as I'm on VNC, I can't get the icon bar to pop to the front like that. So let's. Uh, so um, if we get another one going like this, uh, this one starts off and we'll play along uh, like that. Um, Etc. Now, the idea of this is that if we get uh, some nice recordings of um, real data from uh, car journeys or train journeys or whatever, then we can improve risk SM a bit because at the moment, if you have a track which goes off the edge of the map, if the if the signal goes off the edge of the map, it, it, risk SM doesn't really do any prediction at the moment and think, oh, I'd better get the next bit of map ready. Uh, you, the whole thing shifts along. You get a great big white space with no map on for a while while it's loading the data and then rendering the map. And all the while you're you're driving along and you don't know where you are, and, or you, you've got this point that's moving across a blank canvas. So um, maybe now we've got GPX player, we'll be able to play some of these things through as though they were coming through from a real live uh, data source like SatNav. Um, and be able to get to risk SM to behave a bit better. But we're not promising anything. It's, it's mainly a demo. It's mainly a demo at the moment. And let me just go and show you just how simple this demo is. So again, we've got that geodata components file there to help make the messages easy. Uh, we've also got a little reporter file, and that's just to send reports uh, if we want to use the reporter module from Martin Avison just to do some debugging. That makes it very easy to send little messages through, uh, which reminds me, I'm meant to double click that boot thing there to actually boot reporter. Uh, and then this is the run image. And it's really very short. That's it. That is doing all of that stuff. Uh, so let's just be, we'll start at the bottom. This says start up the application via this function called GPX player. The GPX player function says initialize via this directory. And then it declares various handlers. So there's a handler for the quit function, which basically says quit the program. There's a handler for the <coughs> program information about to be shown. So that when we move over here, it then puts the right version number into the box, so you don't have to remember you to edit your templates every time. Um, there's the data save message. So the data save and data load messages are the important ones which actually do deal with um, the um, the loading of uh, the loading of data from Filer or from other applications. And uh, all that's happening here is uh, we read the message. Uh, we set the various values, and, and again, these are these are done in a very simple way. You, in basic, you'd be splatting it into particular blocks in the in the in in the memory. Uh, here, you're looking like you're just setting a value: message dot your ref equals message dot my ref, message dot code equals data transfer messages data say back, leaf name is wimp scrap, and then send the message back. Um, and um, then you've got a, a null pole handler here, which is basically saying, wait for the next time interval that we're meant to be waiting for. And once we've got there, play call the play function. 
And the play function is where a lot of the effort is going in, and that's uh, reading through the file. It's, it's progressing through the file, working out which of the various streams which could be happening simultaneously, which of them are going to move, and sending the appropriate message through. So the message through going through is, uh, where is that? Oh, it's in this transmit data function. So we just read the latitude and longitude and transmit the data with that function. Um, and I ought to just show you briefly the stuff to do with reading the actual GPX file. So you have to declare the namespaces of the, of the XML. And then we, that's all you do to load the file. You use a thing called element tree, pass the file name, and that's loaded it all in. And it's now then available uh, like an object in Python to to read through and to find bits from it. And to, um, and we're also using a very nice feature for reading the times. Where's the times gone? I think there's a function <laughs> further up. Yeah, there's a function called read time. So that checks to see what format the time is in and and processes it through one of a couple of different, slightly different versions of a function uh, to read the timestamp in seconds. It's not a risk of timestamp in this particular case, because all I want to know is how we, we when we drop the file on the on the icon bar, we're setting the start time as being the time you drop it. And then it's just a matter of how long do we have to wait for the next point in the in the journey. Um, so we only need to know the difference in seconds from the start time. Uh, yeah, so that's it. It's quite nice. Um, if you were doing that fully, you know, if you're doing that with basic, then your date times would be a bit more fiddly to do. You could use the operating system to do that. Um, the operating system calls give you five byte uh, time stamps, which are a pain to work with. Uh, you usually kind of forget some of the data and turn it into a four byte thing that you can actually do arithmetic with. Um, I think probably the uh, the times that Python is giving us a floating point, um, but I wouldn't know, you know, it, it just works. Um, so it's very nice. Anyway, uh, the next one um, we're going to do is uh, water levels. Now, I think I'm going to go somewhere else. So. Oxford, Oxfordshire, I think is the one I want. Um, and we have a water levels application here. Now, this is uh, more along the lines of here's a traditional let's talk to Risk SM uh, thing. So we've now got water levels. Uh, and this is using the Environment Agency's API. Now, apologies if any of this is a, a touchy subject at the moment with the floods, uh, but um, this is very useful information. It's all the water level measuring stations in the country are available through an API from the Environment Agency. Uh, so here are a number of places that they're measuring data in Oxford. Um, and what we can do is uh, hover over the uh, in and control click, and it will then go and fetch the last seven days worth of data. Sorry, there's a reporter window here because it's still in development. So you'll see here we've got a uh, new Botley measuring station, and I'll just uh, drop that onto, I don't know whether I should really drop it onto Zap because Zap is very temperamental about CSV files. So you see, you get the date time and um, a number for your water level in, I presume, a meters, but it's hard to know what the base is. Now, of course, you might want to compare a few of them. Oh, we don't want that one. Yeah. That may go wrong horribly. Bother. Uh, yeah, there are a few. I should have prepared this properly. There are a few where uh, the date time passing has not worked. I think they're a slightly different type of uh, measuring station. You're getting all the bugs today. Have I done that one? Is that SQL yeah. stream? No, I haven't done that one. That was that was SQL stream. This was new botley. Okay. Uh, yeah. But that one's just as bad. Sorry, try which one? Charwell. Okay, let's have a go on the Charwell. 
up here. Yeah. Oh dear. Tell you what, where was I going before? Um I think I was doing I think I was doing Nottingham actually. Um we'll find some around Nottingham because they were reliable around there. So that one's got to get have a bit more worked on it. Yeah, um it's gone and quit, hasn't it? Let's have another go. So um what I was wanting to demonstrate is, oh yes, it was a bit further out than that. I'm just going to fetch them. Um, water levels. And 21 points. And there were certainly some round here which worked okay. So there's Carlton and Rainfall Station, River Trent. Now, that, that's an interesting one. Um, oh, you know what? I wanted to show you uh, all what's going on there. So. So Carlton, the message came through from uh, water levels, so just saying it was Tell you what, we'll start again with this. No, we won't. Um, Windmon, if you're a programmer, is a brilliant tool. It allows you to uh, see all of the messages which are going on between different tasks and see what you're doing wrong, which is absolutely right. So um, when we click on, have we tried that one yet? Mm. Um, when we click on this, Sacris Lane Park, you'll see that the message that went through says Daybrook, Nottingham. And I think it should have used that name. <laughs> I think there's something wrong with this. Right, okay, something definitely wrong. Okay, so so the, the message <laughs> the message that comes through from water levels gives the name of the station, Daybrook, Nottingham, City of Nottingham. And that's meant to appear up here, uh, but that's gone wrong. Yeah, it's called that, Chris. Um, water levels calls it Zachary Lane Park. It's Risco's calling it Daybrook. Oh, sorry. Have we not got the messages going in both directions? I don't know lost here anyway right the point is the point is i perhaps i better not show you that because i'm getting totally confused um the point is that uh water levels gives the name of uh the place that the water levels are taken like carlton or sacris lane park but for rainfall stations the names it transmits through to um uh risk osm is simply rainfall station that's it when risk osm sends the message back to water levels to ask for the detailed data to be fetched um risk osm sends the name uh sends the description of the place saying river trent nottingham or near spring lane uh lamley um yeah that's what's going on so in this particular case where is it where's that window gone uh, so Risk OSM's description is Daybrook, Nottingham, City of Nottingham. Now, if it's a rainfall station, water levels will say, hey, you know what, our description of this in the window is pretty rubbish. And it then adds on the information that comes from Risk OSM to make it a bit more meaningful. That was a very long-winded way of saying all of that. So you can tick and untick these boxes to decide which ones you want to include. Um, I wasn't really wanting so many rainfall stations, I do have to say. Um, we will try and get, oh, that's another one. Never mind. Also, it gets a bit embarrassing when you get more than five because the window doesn't get bigger yet. Um, so we'll just go with this. And um, I'm going to drop it on there. Um, and let's find fireworks and load it in. Um, 
insert overwriting blank cells. And then we go like this. And then we go up again, and then we go down again. More carefully, we stop there. And then we go for a line chart. Create. And so you can then get this uh, rather nice chart that unfortunately has the key right over the middle, but it's moved out of the way. Um, and the rainfall stations are on there jumping about a lot because that's what rainfall stations do. And then the um, water level, Thackeray's Lane is that yellow one down there. Carlton's the red one. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why it's so, it's got a lot of um, wobble in those readings. Perhaps something's gone wrong. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you can go and gather lots of different sets of, of water levels uh, from different stations and do yourself some nice charts. Now, obviously, um, there's all sorts of enhancements that you could do to this. You could have some sort of setting to make sure you can say how many days worth of water levels you want to read. Um, but again, uh, this is being done using um, Python. And uh, this time, it's using a, a JSON uh, parser because the data comes back as a JSON file. Um, so again, you've got this stuff here, um, which um, there's the API call. It goes off to Environment Data Gov UK uh, and the latitude and longitude and the distance from it. They're, they're, they're the ones we want to read. Um, and I've put the, the stuff to do with the actual reading the information from the different measuring stations into separate file to make it neater. And that uh, has a different URL in there somewhere or other to go and get uh, the last seven days worth of readings. There we are. There's the URL is built up from the ID of the station readings uh, 700 quarter hour uh, readings makes about um, seven days, actually. Um, yeah, so again, it's uh, it's quite good. And um, just to put a bit of perspective on this, um, I think I started working on um, uh, GPX player and water levels um, about a week and a half ago, and I've not been doing that solid. Um, so it was quite quick to put this stuff together. And a lot of that was sort of wrestling with the toolbox, which I'm not very familiar with, and trying to work out how to do things in Python, which I'm only learning as well. Um, and it was, but it was quite productive. Um, so really, I'm, I'm really quite keen on uh, the idea of using Python for risk loss applications, uh, because for one thing, there's masses of tutorials out there for how to do things in Python. There's lots of really good um, libraries and things built into it to do things which, um, you know, you don't want to have to do all of the work building a JSON parser or building an XML parser. It's just a way of getting your data in. So if you can just tell a standard component to read the data in, and then you've got the fun of doing what you want to do with the data, that just makes it a whole lot more enjoyable. Anyway, the last one we want to show you is something more fun. And uh, over Christmas, I was trying to sort out, I'm just going to unshare the screen if I can find the right bits and bobs for the moment while I get some other thing else set up. Um, stop share. Well, perhaps we'll pause share, that's right, uh, while I go and look for things on my machine. Um, where am I meant to go? File Explorer. Um, yeah, so do you want to talk a little bit about the audio device that we used to have, Hillary, while uh, I, I can try. Uh, and, and why it went wrong and what I was doing? Yes, uh, we some years ago, when our CD player stopped working, we bought a new device which could rip, say, CDs onto a hard disk, and then we could access them through its own interface. Um, 
However, its hard disk went wrong at the end of last year. Um, happily, we had a backup of most of the CDs we'd ripped. Um, so we've been trying to find an alternative way into accessing our CDs as we don't want to have to put them all onto another device. And we dug out a Raspberry Pi and found um, with Linux, a, 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 yeah, a Raspberry Pi with Linux, and found there was a database system. I don't know what you call this thing. You right. Yeah, with. I'll do this bit. So, and I'm back to back to. I've just about found what I needed to find. Um, so yeah, uh, we've got. Um, yeah. Um, so there's lots of different options. If you want to build a an audio player and streamer and stuff on the Raspberry Pi, there's lots of packages you can just install from Linux, which will do all of that. And uh, very, you know, there's so much choice, in fact, that we really didn't know what to use. Um, and I was starting to think, well, actually, you know what, we've got this, I've already got this database of all the CDs. I've even built a PHP web interface to it. Um, what I just want is a command line way of, of playing music from Linux so I can build my own player because uh, that sounds like a fun project. Um, so I searched for, you know, music player command line Linux or something like that and um, came across uh, what I didn't know existed, which is something called Music Player Daemon. And uh, Music Player Daemon. Um, runs on your Linux box and you basically point it as all your music and it reads all the metadata it can from the music files, assuming they've got tags in the things. And you can then talk to Music Player Daemon with a whole range of different clients. So uh, I'm just going to bring up if I can get the right stuff on, on view. Um, let's get rid of that. So, Sorry about this. There's just too many windows open all over the place now. Um, and the Zoom controls are in the way. Um, my phone's gone off again. Right, OK. Um, we'll be there in a minute. Right, OK. Let's bring VNC back on view. Uh, I will share the screen in a moment. Um, so, uh, resume share, that's the one, that's the one we want. Um, and then we need to have this thing, that one there. So, uh, hopefully you can all see the screen again. Is that all right? Yeah, I can see the screen. Great. So, this bit in the window is actually a, a, from my uh, phone. Oh, I'm just turning around. Um, and this is a... Uh, a music player daemon client for Android. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just paging through the music. Um, so we've now all got this installed on our phones and uh, you can you can tap on the on the music and uh, choose what you want to play and off it goes and you can control. I'll just jump to that one um, and uh, you can control the volume and all that kind of thing. You can build up a playlist. I mean, we've got various BBC radio podcasts uh, in, uh, put on it using a, a Python script, stuff like this. So, um, uh, Matthew, can I, sorry? can I interrupt you? We're, we're, we're still seeing the, um, the Risk of SM screen. Ah, you've not got something in the middle? No. Oh, no. We were sharing the Risk of SM screen earlier. Oh, whoops. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. New share. So is it? I could do that, but I thought I was, I was. I'm sharing that. Right. Let's share the whole screen, and then you've got. Right. Okay. So you've got both now. I hope that's not too distracting. So here is because I do need both of them for later in the demo. So let me go back again. Uh, so here's the view of the of the artists and whatever you know, and we can go into one of them, um, and. Um, it's got the cover from the CD, the picture of the artist it's loading from 
an online database, I think, and and you go into the you go into the album and you you press play, uh, and then there's this control thing at the bottom, and you can change the volume, uh, you can jump to another track, etc. So we've all got this installed on our phones now, and so far we haven't had wars with people choosing different things all at once. Uh, though anyone in the house would be able to change what people are listening to, which uh, I've told I've told other family members that if there's any trouble, I'm just going to change the password on the system. So there we go. Um, so this is all very nice. By the way, there isn't a loudspeaker in this room, yeah. which is why you can't hear what we're playing. Yeah. In fact, the amplifier upstairs isn't turned on. It's only the streaming device that's turned on. So no one is being disturbed by this. Um, and yeah, if I just uh, go, where do you get to the playlist bit? Um, yes, yeah, so if I go there to so playlists, you can build your own playlists. And we've got a load of podcasts here. Um, and I've got a Python script that can load, download download podcast lists uh, from the BBC website, and you can click on them, and it'll download the file and play that if you want to. Or you can go into uh, Internet Radio, uh, play that. Um, yeah, so it's all quite versatile. Now, let's um, see if we can move that to one side. Oh, wait a minute. So this bit here is the uh, what we're currently playing, and that's uh, that's there. So we thought, well, uh, actually, as this is an open protocol, which uh, I don't know whether I can wait a minute. I'm having trouble moving the window. There we are. Let's move this to the side. Okay, so that's over there. Um, because it's an open pro protocol, it's all documented. I thought, well, why don't we write a little? MPD client for Riscos in Python, just for fun. So here is uh, MPD client. Uh, if I left click on it, you'll see it's opened up here. Um, we can see that it thinks we're partway through uh, storms in Africa. Um, if I click paused, uh, then the position changes to red. If I go back to this one, you'll see when my phone wakes up, uh, it is not playing either. Um, and if I click play on there, it'll start playing again. And you'll see over here, it says unpaused over here. Change the volume here. The volume will change over on the riskless one. Let's move up to Evening Falls. And the track name has changed over there. So that's all rather nice. Um, so um, providing you're all not too bored. If anyone's bored, you can always leave. <laughs> what we're going to do now, very quickly, if I can find the right piece of paper, is uh, just demonstrate. Because obviously, this this MPD client thing that I've written is it's a bit kind of basic. It's just got a tick box for applause, and it's got a square box here for play. Well, the great thing is, of course, I have prepared some. Um, sprites with some nice buttons. We just need to put them into the application. So first of all, we need to load ResEd, Ed and um, we're going to open the control window and look at the gadgets. And what we want is one of these button thingies, which is basically a fairly generic um, Whoops, uh, let's put that back there. This is not going to be a brilliant um, piece of work. And we're going to set the client sprite area. The sprite is going to be called uh, previous. What else do we have to do? Um, on tick text, tick sprite. Um, button type three, otherwise it won't receive any events. Um, no border. We can add the help text. Previous track. Um, I think that's it. Is that right? I've got that. So 
there's a little and you see it's got the uh, it's got the little icon it's great isn't it and then what we do i'm now going to hold down the shift key i'm just telling you that because you can't see me doing it and we'll we'll drag that and copy that and drag it and copy it and we'll drag it and copy it and we'll drag it and copy it to round about there and then we'll go in and we'll call this one. What's the next one? Is it over here? What's Play. What's next? Pause. 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 Stop. Stop. And next. And you'll notice I've left the help text the same for all of them, which is going to be fun. But uh, I'm not going to change them now. Um, and then we save the res file. Save, save the rest file. So that's that bit done. Uh, and then we need to alter the run image. So near the top, we need to, uh, we need to get WIMP events, mouse, or whatever it is. Yes. From toolbox. <laughs> Uh, mouse under little click. Um, oh, I dropped wrong thing. Underscore click. Import mouse click. So this is importing a little thing which uh, helps Python understand mouse click events in the WIMP. Um, then. We just need to go down here and we're going to say, well, first of all, we're going to turn block editing on and we're going to say component equals not x a. And then we're going to do um, b. See, those, those are little numbers that you might have noticed in the res file, which indicate they're sort of like the icon numbers um, uh, in, um, they're the reference things that will basically tell the program what you've clicked on. And then we have previous. And then a bit further down, now you'll see here, uh, these little functions are the ones which are called to um actually send the commands through to the mpd player um and we're going to need a few more um and like that it's not spelled right i like recycling letters where i can Happens that there are very intuitive names for these uh, commands in the MPD system. Um, so these, by the way, they go and talk to this uh, send command function here, which does the socket connection using socket functions, which are pretty standard stuff. And there's a lot of documentation on this in Python, but it's very similar to how you do it from basic or from C. So that sends the command that gets the stuff back again. Um, and then we need to go down to here and if you turn the page we've got so first of all we're going to say we're um writing here a wimp handler for the mouse click event and we're defining a function called mouse clicked we could call it anything actually because actually the function isn't directly called by name anywhere uh, it's called from the toolbox library um, and um, but it, it sort of makes sense to give it a sensible name um, and the colon means here's the block of code that's this part of this function python is very insistent on everything being indented correctly because that's how it understands uh, where the blocks of code and the functions start and end and the 
if clauses is entirely by the indentation, which kind of forces you to have to uh, do your indentation really neatly. Um, so if you don't like being neat, you might not like Python no, too much. I've done three, yes, okay, I need to do four. I'm not, I'm gonna miss out the report line. Um, so what we say here is if component, so I'm testing the component value uh, with, the, with the right spelling, um, equals next component. Oh yes, and it's equals equals in languages like Python and C to test things like that. And we say next, and that calls the next function. And then we say elif uh, component equals previous component. Oh, it's equals equals. Yeah, oh, it's a good job I've got someone to do my proofreading over my shoulder. Uh, I've also noticed another little problem. I've not got the right indentations there. Python would be upset. And then um, we could then do the play and the stop and the pause, but I can't be bothered to do all of them now. Uh, and I've just missed out something here. Uh, so, so when we uh, when we when we've handled an event like a mouse click, we return the value true to the library, and that says. Look, I've dealt with this. No one else needs to have a look in on this particular uh, event. Um, I've handled this click. Um, and if we haven't handled it because it was something else, then we return false and the toolbox system can pass it around any other parts of the uh, code. So I'm hoping now, sorry, I did just save it. Oh, it has, hasn't it? Control F3 is up there. I must have pressed something else. Um, no, I don't know either. Let's hope it didn't introduce a bug. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we go back to there and run this again, then we should be able to find uh, that, aha, if I click on the previous one, it's going to evening falls. And if I click on the next one, it's going to river and then back to the long ships. Let's go back again. And we should find that on the uh, on the one over here, which has gone to sleep again, um, you'll see we've got uh, river. If we click back there, we're back onto Evening Falls, and it's on Evening Falls here. Now, of course, that's not really very risk -ossy, is it? Because we've clicked, but we haven't adjust clicked. A just click to go the other way is absolutely essential if we're writing a proper risk loss application. So we're going to put another little test in here, uh, which is if event dot buttons and for that's uh, doing a boolean uh, check. If event dot buttons and for else, uh, oh yes, elif. Mm. I've been really careful here. Elif event bot buttons and one, which is the adjust button. Um, previous. Um, and, and then we have the return show bit, which is just fine. And similarly, we can take that code and put it down here, copy that to there. And uh, just by changing those numbers round, uh, I can make that button go the other way. Control F3 to save. Uh, now, actually, come to think of it, having having made this alteration, I am now going to demonstrate. Well, I suppose I can. Yeah, you you can't you can't tell you can't tell which button I'm clicking, uh, but I'm keeping my mouse in the same place, and. Funnily enough, we're now going back to evening falls. So I think that's proved to you that um, I can go to and from with this uh, with this thing. Um, so that's added some buttons, and some of them aren't working, but it's going to be very easy to to make the rest of them work. So 
I think that's all we have prepared, really. I hope that's not too long or too dull. Um, and um, I don't know what you do now. Do you have questions or do you just tell me to get lost? Have you yeah, uh, questions? Have you seen the article in the ROCC magazine for December about um, using Risk OSM? Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a subscriber to Rock Magazine, so I have not. Ah, it was showing how to use a CSV file to generate a file that could be dropped into the National Library of Scotland and show the detail that, uh, in the same way as it would show in RISC OSM with colours, coloured markers and what have you, because... I'm if you drop a CSV file into RISC OSM um, with various colours set for the pins and things, and then export it as a GPX, it's in the right format for the NLS maps to know what colours to use and what size uh, pin wow. to use. Oh, uh, that's, that's amazing. 25 inch map. <laughs> I'm really surprised about that because I thought you saw the pin colours in the custom. Uh... Uh, I think pink colours might be. Maybe the pink colours are standard. Pink yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a nice. That's a nice piece of work. Yeah. So it's I'll, really good to hear people are writing up this kind of stuff. I'll send you a copy of the newsletter so you can see the article. <laughs> that's very kind. I don't know whether Chris Johns did join us. Has he? I've not. Uh... Yes, he's on. He's on. He's online. Oh great! Well, uh, yeah, it's been very helpful, and uh, it's been uh, it's been a pleasure exploring the, uh, the the Python stuff. I've been doing a bit of Python at work as well, so uh, you're still sharing the screen. I am still sharing the screen. That was just in case we needed to demonstrate anything, but I can take it off if people prefer. Yeah, so uh, I think one of the things I need to work out um, and check with him is what the best way is of distributing some of these things because I'd like to get them out uh, available for people to download and explore because it might inspire you to write your own applications. And as you can see, it's, it doesn't just have to be with Risk OSM. It can be talking to, it doesn't have to be even talking to another computer, but these examples I happen to have done have all been networking in one way or another with other things and processing data. So um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check, I'll be checking with Chris, I hope about the best way of packaging it all up uh, or making sure that the right version of the uh, Python library is available. And then I'd like to get them out and, uh, oh, it would be really lovely to have time to to write a few little tutorials on how to get started with some of this stuff because it's actually, once you get into it, uh, it is really good and pleasurable to program in. You know, it's not fiddly, you, you know, it's, it's, it's really very nice. Very modern, very up to date, lots of facilities. And for writing little things like this that aren't doing masses of data processing, it's excellent uh, because you really want to be able to keep that um, coding and testing cycle down and very quick development. That's one of the attractions about BASIC is because you can very quickly test, you don't have to compile it or anything like that. And the same is true of Python, and it's very, very nice. Um, if you're wanting to do lots of big data processing, I think SVI still has the edge, partly because Python, with its built-in libraries and so on, um, those libraries are assuming that you're in a in a multitasking, in a preemptive multitasking environment. So if you were loading some gigantic file and parsing it, the whole machine would lock up on RISCOS until that was done, um, because it's written in a way which assumes that you've got a multi a, a preemptive multitasking thing that's managing your your different tasks. Uh, so you have, might have to write things in a slightly different way to get them responsive on risk offs. But it can enable you to do some things which would otherwise be quite, really quite difficult to do. Um, I wouldn't have, I might not have known how to start on, on, doing, on doing some of these things. If I was doing it in basic or C, it would be quite a lot of work to get going. Uh, whereas there's masses and masses of help for Python on the web and lots of really good tutorials. And a lot of it is really very applicable. The, the basic processing is really applicable. We just need a bit of documentation about the toolbox uh, 
library um, and then you'd be well away writing all sorts of things uh, really nice stuff anyway I'm going to say there have been a few comments on the chat so oh yes I have on there <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah, lots of good comments from Chris. I better I better read a bit more. Um yeah. Yes, yeah, I think indeed it, it the 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 event library it really does shorten things. Development library, there's so much is in there that just does what you need to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I've not really had much uh, experience with the toolbox. Um, I find the toolbox a little bit frustrating because uh, even with the toolbox, there are things where you think, oh, right, I've just got to go back to using the WIMP stuff because they, they never really provided anything. Um, so, uh, but the the saving, I meant to show you the saving in, um, let's just find it for, um, where are we? The saving for water levels. Um, so, yeah, here we are. Um, where it is that's how I ought to do a search here we are right so I've got a bit of code which um, there we are station.buildcsv so that code whenever you tick or untick any of the water levels on that save as window that this gets invoked, this update CSV function gets invoked, and that rebuilds the CSV file uh, ready to be saved. It's not saved yet, it's just in memory. It rebuilds it. Uh, and then what we do, we just simply tell the toolbox that the address of the data that needs to be saved is that, and the length of it is, is, is this. And because of the way I've set up the gadgets or the, the, the save as window, um, I've told it, you know, you don't need to talk to me for saving this actual file. And the toolbox will then handle all of the stuff to do with the dragging and dropping it, and it'll use RAM transmit or, or saving via a temporary scrap file, depending on what the other application wants to do. And all of that is just handled for you, and you don't have to write any of that messages. You know, If you can build what you're saving in memory and point the toolbox at it, it'll do the rest, uh, which is really refreshing. Um, and even if it didn't do the rest, I should think that Chris could probably build a mix in in Python, which would do quite a bit of it, quite a bit of the other things uh, if you needed to. And uh, that's where it's really nice. You can build these components, which you can reuse from one application to another very nicely. Right. I'd better stop talking unless there's other questions or do people want to see anything else, comments, etc. Well, I think the uh, little programs you're doing for the water levels and the police and that are all very uh, interesting. Um, I'll be having a play with them when they become available. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, something that I wasn't quite clear on. Uh, was that uh, MPD client uh, just a programming exercise or is that going to be a commercial or freely available program? Uh, well, I have absolutely no idea whether any other RISCOS users have set up an MPD daemon on any of their kit. Uh, now, I suspect that the, the number of RISCOS users is fairly small these days, and the number of them who've also set an MPD daemon up will be even smaller. Uh, but I've I, I don't see why I should make it commercial when there might only be one user. <laughs> let's uh, <laughs> let's let's put it up as a nice programming example, and uh, then maybe maybe someone might enhance it. Because you you may you you may have noticed there is absolutely no way to select what music to listen to on this MPD client at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I I kind of skirted over that. 
Um, yeah, well, a minor but, problem. You know, yeah, yeah. Maybe someone else might develop that for me. And then... He's only been writing it about two days. Well, true. Uh, yeah. Th this yeah. is the thing that uh, is surprising to me. I, I mean, I, I can't program bubbling basically. If I did, it'd take me years anyway. So, so to hear a programmer saying that he's managed to do something, you know, semi-useful in a day or two, uh, sort of opens up the whole thing. And I know Python was one of the things that uh, people were keen to get ported over to RiskOS, and I can understand why if you can do things like this from libraries and things like that. I mean, it's, it's way above what I can do, but I can see uh, you know, notionally how easy it is. So Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Oh, uh, here's something I need to talk to Chris Johns about. Um, I need to work out how to get the character conversion done properly because this is all coming across in UTF-8 <laughs> and I need to change it to Latin 1 to go into the icon and I've not quite worked out that we're right to bits of magic yet. But anyway, <laughs> as you can see, it's not meant to look like that. No, I mean it's it's well one of the things uh, that it's useful. It's it's using something from a phone on Risco, which I don't think really we've got anything else at all. So even just having a music player of some description would be a bonus because I'm sure a lot of us have Android phones. Yeah. Now, of course, what's actually happening here? You don't. You know, the the music is coming out of a little Raspberry Pi that's sitting in the in the living room. Right. That's, your, that's your actual server. Yeah. yeah. So 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 that's attached to the amplifier. The music isn't going to be coming out of the computer or indeed no. out of the phone. The phone no, is just no. being used in lieu of a remote control. And this is yes. a similar thing where you could, if I was sitting down here using my Riscos machine, I could then change the music. Because we yeah. might get another device for down here and attach it to the head to the speakers which are sitting behind me, uh, yeah. which are yeah. currently not in use. So yeah, then we can have two of them, and that'll get confusing because we have to connect to the right one. But um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, probably the most complicated thing in this whole MPD client was uh, reading the uh, the binary data over the protocol in order to get JPEG appearing. But I was determined to do it because I thought it would look so much more impressive. Of course, you've only yeah, ever, you've, yeah. you've only seen that one. So, for mm. all you know, I might have um, I might have just hardwired it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, here we go. There's one, and the, and the window even changes yeah. width uh, yeah, to yeah. accommodate the different uh, yeah. different pictures. So, uh, yeah. There yeah you I go. think. Um, well, if anybody else sees this uh, this video that you've you've done here, uh, well, we'll be seeing in a few days on the website, uh, the YouTube site. Uh, might encourage people to look up, you know, if you've done Python programming, oh, we could, we could do something on RiskOS as well, just for something different. So, yeah, good stuff. So, I, I will speak in, in lurking. Um, Good to see the library actually being used as well. That's the uh, that's all the idea of writing it <laughs> to get people to make it easy to program stuff. So. Yes, you never know. I, I might even bother to learn Python. <laughs> all, all I've done with Python so far is help my son debug his um, GCSE project, and that was very much um, winging it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but there are some skills which are pretty transferable, aren't they? <laughs> like, put some debugging in. Loop <laughs> are you sure you can't you have a, a more a more descriptive variable name that makes sense? <laughs> yes, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to think. Question: I can see on that screen something called Urban Obs. Oh yes, uh, that doesn't work very well. Uh, so that's another little bit of Python, um, and um, if we just bring this map to the front and go to uh, Newcastle, uh, not Newcastle, uh, but Newcastle, and of course I mean the one upon Tyne, uh, just north of here, and we'll zoom in. Um, let me run the urban obs, which you'll see has a beautiful icon that's a sort of mush of map walker with just some extra stuff on to make it sure it doesn't uh, get confused with anything else. And oh, good grief, what a lot of bars there are in Newcastle. It's shocking. It's, it is. It's incredible. Don't go there. Um, 
Anyway, um, if we go to find web photos and geo data, you can get Urban Observatory. And this is a research project which is being run by the new by the University of Newcastle. Um, and they have various sensors around the city. And this will show you where they are within this map. Um, and um, this is an example of where it's not multitasking very well because it's doing such a lot of work. So this is another one that's in Python. Um, and I'll just talk and wrap it on a bit while it's doing the fetching. What you will get on the map, if it doesn't explode, um, is a whole load of sensors um, around uh, the middle of Newcastle, 295. So if you don't want to appear on camera, don't come to Newcastle. <laughs> um, there, and there's a whole variety of different things here. So the idea with this urban observatory is they, they're, they're measuring all kinds of things around the city and making this available through APIs. So this is, tells you where all the sensors are, but uh, what I haven't got working yet is actually retrieving the data. And I think they're in the process of changing from one style of API to another. And I couldn't work out what was, I was doing wrong. So I think a small number of these work, but I'm not going to click on them because I'm bound to get the ones that don't. Um, and I didn't have time to polish it up a bit. I was working on this back in the summer. Um, and uh, it, and some of them actually, there are water level ones in here. So they've got data from the Environment Agency, they've pulled it into Urban Observatory. They've got data from other sources and they've pulled it into Urban Observatory. And then there are other sensors which are part of this research project, which is especially for them. And they've got things like stuff which um, looks down on people in the shopping street and counts the footfall of people walking up north up and down Northumberland Street for the shops and round Eldon Square. And you know, it's not recording any facial stuff or anything like that. It's just recording the numbers of people at different times of day. And you can go in and you can see these charts and graphs and just uh, see how busy it is and think, right, okay, if I want to set up my donut stall, that's the time of the week to do it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what it's for, really. But anyway, there's all sorts of different readings, air quality, noise, uh, rainfall, um, goodness knows what. Um, so that was going to be a way of getting into that, but it's not very well developed yet because all I've got is points on the map. I think it might tell you in the pins and tracks. Let's just see. Um, if we go, oh, sorry. Um, um, We've got these water levels, haven't we, first? Um, so here we've got urban observatory. It, um, you've got air quality monitors, those per air mon. Um, there's, I think these are measuring the number of people in, in various public buildings. There's car park, um, uh, you know, car park occupancy, yeah internal building don't know what that is um yeah so um i don't, I don't know i don't know what they all are uh, because i haven't really got very many of them working but uh um yeah tons of stuff yes this is number of people crossing eldon square from the east to the north side or uh, I think, yeah, the Eldon Square seems to be riddled with these sensors. <laughs> and um, that's near the, one of the big bus stations, I think. Uh, Gray Street. Yeah. So anyway, that's what, it's, that's what it's all up to. There's probably other towns where there's some of these kinds of things going on, but I'm aware of this one because of following some Newcastle people on Twitter and I saw some announcements about it. But hopefully, you know, with... Um, if I get some of this stuff released so you, you can see how, how to do it, then maybe people who have other data sources that are interesting to them might be able to work out how to do them themselves. Because, you know, I've not, we've not got enough time to, to uh, explore all the stuff that's out there and turn it into a little risk us application. Uh, so uh, if people want to do that, then if we can make it easier by providing some examples, that, that's all to the good. Very interesting. Yeah, I was just thinking, you were saying this is University of Northumberland. That's obviously just around the corner, sort of, isn't it? Do you think it'd be worth just con contacting them and saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at doing something with mapping? Uh, 
can you tell us what APIs are changing to or just have a visit? Do you trip? Well, I think they I think they, they have got the documentation up. It's just I found this a bit confusing and uh, I couldn't work out whether the bad results I was getting were because I was doing the programming wrong. Uh, and really, I'd I'd want to spend a little bit more time exploring that before I start talking to them. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think... Uh, yeah. yeah, I just so, I was thinking of it. They've got, a, they've, got a very nice, they've got a very nice website, actually, and you can go to the website and see graphs of a lot of this stuff online. So, you, you know, in many ways, that's kind of the better way to interact with their data because they've already provided quite a good interface for people. Um, yeah, I was just going to try and see what I could get uh, mm. onto the map, uh, which is at the moment just a load of pins. <laughs> yeah. No, I just think they might be surprised to know that RiskOS can do something like this. You know, uh, yeah. obviously I'll be using PCs and Macs, and you, you might be able to show them a Raspberry Pi or some small machine and go, oh. Well, right. I mean, the <laughs> ironic thing is that I should think that an awful lot of these sensors will be talking back via a Raspberry Pi or something like that oh, because no it doubt. will be yeah. some yeah. little cheap board like that. There's yeah. there's a there's a chat. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the company, but there's a, there's a company up in Newcastle run by someone I'm aware of on Twitter, who who builds uh, sensors for doing uh, analysis of uh, flows of traffic and traffic in the most general sense, including people and bicycles and everything. Yes, he's got yeah. this sort of computer vision thing. It must be, I, I think, it must be a Raspberry Pi with camera, you know, and. Mm. Uh, it can record and and work out, you know, it can draw lines on the photo to show, oh, yes, the, all, all these people were turning left or those ones were turning right and there'll be yeah. and, and all of these flows and it can do really accurate counting. And they've some of the sensors on, on Northumberland Street, uh, the main shopping street, are from his company. And, um, yeah, and he, he goes around uh, the country, you know, I, I know that he's exported some of these as well. Um, so uh, there are devices being used to to just measure and help help um, urban her, urban planners to you know make sure that well, the city is really well designed. So it, well, it's, it's traffic management, isn't it? And traffic can be people, bicycles, cars, and it's sometimes yeah. it's yeah. sometimes it's actually making the case for things. So you can say, yes. well, look, you've got this number of people, uh, and actually there's a decent number of people cycling here. So a, a, a cycle route would really help boost this. And yeah. it's worth putting the money in, or it's it's mm. worth putting a pedestrian crossing in here because everyone seems to want to cross here. But look how difficult yeah. they're finding it. They're waiting on average five minutes at the side of the road, and you know you could measure all that with with an observation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. All good stuff. Any more questions? Is there any other developments on your other products going on at the moment? Um, no. You're talking to me. <laughs> no free time whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> No, there's not, not too much going on at the minute. <laughs> well, I don't know. They, they could detect how many coats there are. Then they could compare it with Leeds, see whether it's, uh, see, see if Leeds is any more hardy or not than Newcastle. <laughs> well, Good. Well, it's nice to see you all. Um, and uh, yeah, I. Sounds like we're probably wrapping up, if that's all right. Is the guy who's doing the recording going to turn it off at some point? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll disconnect in a second, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Risk of SM is growing rapidly.